cervical spondylosis is the most common problem that is seen in general practice and i think everyone will agree with that so being a common problem it can be very easily misdiagnosed so how does it develop so the first thing that happens in spondylotic process is a reduction in the height of the disc uh, this happens because of repeated use also some people are prone to it definitely genetically but it happens because of repeated use wrong posture this as you all know is a structure which is not uh, which does not have direct blood supply the nutrition supply of the disc comes from the surrounding vertebrae there is migration of fluid across the end plate into the disc and that's how the disc gets nourished so intervertebral disc does not have blood supply so as the age advances and as awkward posturing and awkward movements increase in frequency due to our day to day life challenges and our professions the disc height starts reducing so as the disc height starts reducing the body gets the signal that there is some instability at this area so the body's response is to send calcium in this area to stabilize anything that is unstable calcium starts getting deposited around the disc circumferential so when it gets deposited behind the disc the spinal canal gets encroached and uh, if it is very severe then the spinal cord starts getting compressed if the calcium spicules start compressing on the exiting nerves then you will get compression on individual nerve root which is going in the upper extremity so if the spondylotic process crosses or increases beyond limit then there is a compression of the nervous elements and you start getting serious symptoms of spondylosis and these are the symptoms which one should not miss in general practice so as you can see here th this is a fairly normal height of the disc here seen between the vertebral bodies and here the height of the disc is reduced and new bone or osteophytes are forming so these are beak like projections these are the osteophytes as we see in the x-rays of the patients with spondylosis you compare this level that is this is c2 c3 c3 c4 now c3 c4 disc height is all right there are no osteophytes here here you can see these spicules these are the osteophytes these are actually deposition of calcium crystals uh, almost forming a new bone here you can again see a big osteophyte here and there is one big osteophyte behind so if the spinal canal gets encroached on by these osteophytes then the spinal cord as i said can get compressed so this is a very beautiful picture uh drawing actually in a patient with spondylosis with the neck in extension you can see that this this is extended neck and this is a spinal cord and you can see these calcium spicules or the osteophytes compressing the spinal cord here and the ligamentum flavum the ligament which is behind the cord folding inside and compressing the cord and the cord getting compressed very beautiful drawing very self explanatory and this drawing shows how in spondylosis the diameter of of the cervical spinal canal reduces it is usually 13 to 16 millimeters and here it has become 11 millimeters the space for the spinal cord has reduced and any neck movements at this point of time will repeatedly compress the spinal cord giving rise to progressive myelopathy so are some people prone to develop cervical spondylosis the answer to this is yes actually uh, there are some genetic studies which prove that the osteophyte formation in some people is more than in other people in some people uh, the spinal canal diameter is congenitally small and in these people if the osteophytes are formed then even with small osteophytes these people will start getting neurological symptoms so early symptoms of spondylosis is as i said as the body detects that there is change in the disc height the body will put the neck muscles in spasm and there will be pain associated with this spasm so neck pain is the earliest symptom of spondylosis now this neck pain one has to remember is not always restricted to the neck this is something one has to remember because the pain of cervical spondylosis can spread right in between the scapulae it can spread into the shoulder and it can also spread in the occipital region not only that sometimes it can spread in the temporal region so a facet joint uh, osteophyte somewhere here can cause pain in the temporal region so this is very well known thing and the reason for that is the trigeminal ganglion comes down into the spinal cord and that's why uh, these areas are overlapped as far as the pain referral is concerned so neck pain is not only actual neck pain 
it is also shoulder pain it is trapezial pain it is occipital pain and sometimes the pain above uh, the ears that is in the temporal posterior temporal region and the occipital region so this pain at times is very very severe if there is muscle spasm repeatedly happening then the muscle attachment points become trigger points and they become extremely sensitive and these people can get absolutely debilitating pain with cervical spondylosis so these are the common tender points also in cervical spondylosis this is the area which usually people People tell you when they have cervical spondylotic pain, they are having severe stiffness and pain in this area. Of course, there are some other reasons also at times for this pain. So one has to take a good history and do good examination also. As in the case of low back, when is the neck pain serious? So there are three important things that one has to remember. So if the neck pain is spreading in the hand, that is in the arm or forearm or the hand, fingers, it is radiating, one has to take it seriously. It can be a radiculopathy. If there is myelopathy, now symptoms of myelopathy cervical myelopathy can be initially hidden and that is why I am going to you know tell you in detail about these symptoms the symptoms of myelopathy usually the symptoms of radiation or radiculopathy are very easy to detect one thing that you have to remember is that shoulder pain that is shoulder joint pain and neck pain can sometimes coexist okay now the reason for that is cervical cord compression or root compression causes weakness in the muscles of the shoulder joint so it starts at times at times not always but at times it starts with the cervical cord and root compression the uh, shoulder muscles become weak and the shoulder uh, loses its stability and the shoulder joint degeneration starts so the shoulder pain can be secondary the radiculopathy can be in different fingers in different parts depending on which root is getting compressed so i will come to that afterwards but again for radiculopathy and myelopathy the other red flags are recent trauma the pain neck pain if it awakens you at night if it causes weight loss it is associated with fever if it is rapidly and unexpectedly unexpectedly increasing in severity and if there is a history of cancer in the patient who is having neck pain or there is a history of you know some immunocompromised uh, situation in his or her life the myth of giddiness has been attached to cervical spondylosis for a long time and it happens because there is a foramen transverse area here through which the vertebral artery passes and if a large osteophyte starts compressing on the vertebral artery then in a particular position of the neck person feels giddy because of blood supply to brainstem can reduce this is again a very beautiful slide from the study that i was telling you this is a cross section from a cadaver and you can see a formation of bone this is a bone which is formed this is an osteophyte which is pressing on the spinal cord this is a cross section of the spinal cord and the spinal cord is getting compressed here also if you look at the outgoing root this is the outgoing root and this is the osteophyte which is protruding into the foramen and it is pressing on the outgoing root and this actually could be the reason behind a radiculopathy